increase pulls. You been there? Let's do that. Because then we're not, um... Yeah, let's do that. Alright. I thought you had this big production crew and there would be... this be this... Assistant? Assistant. <laughs> I am in Guam, where I meet John Lawrence of the Western Pacific Field Office of the NRCS. We catch up in my hometown of Hagat in the southwestern shore of the island, where the biodiversity of the Fringe Reef has been a vital part of life here longer than written history can document. From space, the waters look a healthy blue, but the southern landscape, even from miles above the atmosphere, looks and is scarred. These are the shores where I grew up, in an area that is probably where the earliest Chamorro people settled on the island. It is easy to come ashore here. Yet, it is exactly this ease of access that has been causing untold damage to the reef in the form of invasive species. And they occupy it because there's space for them to move into. If you eliminate that space, the native forest is extremely resilient. It's kind of like Pacific Islanders. They're resilient. Mm -hmm. I would have liked John to have brought me to sites of invasive infestation, but he would have none of it. Instead, he wanted to talk about solutions, as there are, in fact, over 100 invasive species currently thriving in Guam. And, and plant trees, which would be easy enough to do because the soil is fairly... Rest this is not that bad a soil right here. You can see all this sort of basaltic um, rock. The black rock. Infestations notwithstanding, John is, in the fact, the a proponent right of using invasives to, to fight to the problem. And the right combination of, of exotics and then transition to natives, you can convert this. So you say plant trees. I say plant trees. Rather than focusing on getting rid of what's already here, I mean... You, you're, you're, you're not going to get rid of it. There's no way. There's no way you can get rid of it. So, because unless you change the habitat that it's that's here, there's always going to be... A um, a an ecosystem, a niche where that plant is, and then you're all spending all this money on eradication. Right. So that you need to control it. We're not gonna we're not gonna eradicate it. Got it. So you control it by restoring. You, you bring back the native. Don't let John's endorsement of invasives fool you. Are, he is actually very fighting very hard in that for the natives. They, they are able to tolerate and hang out in shade. Mm. And then when a gap is created either by as a result of a typhoon or age of the tree you know it drops boom the, this next generation comes up yeah but we've lost our seed dispersers and our pollinators so none of that seed by seed dispersers and pollinators he means birds if guam had all the birds it needed could they hold the key So, welcome to the Helen Reef Protected Area. This is one of the um, uh, areas in Palau that is uh, protected and it's also part of the Palau National uh, Protected Areas Network. A small island here and their job is... I am in Helen Reef with Wayne Andrew, a delegate to the Palau Congress from the southwestern island of Hatobe. Long used by the Tabians as a fishing ground, Today, Helen Island is inhabited only by a few members of the Southwestern Islands Conservation Enforcement Team, who patrol these waters for international and illegal fishing boats. And for good reason, for even after years of exploitation and a recent coral bleaching event, Helen Reef today teems with life. Did you catch that? <laughs> the air here is full of life as well. Helen Island is the home to several migratory seabirds who, like the green turtle, have life cycles that begin on this shore. But a decade ago, this freshwater well was near the center of the island. Climate change has made trees a rare commodity. I think of red dirt in the south here, the volcanic dirt, I think of it as really powdery. 
yeah. really just kind of fine, yeah. uh, like a spice almost. It's, 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 it's highly weathered uh, volcanic ash. It was rock at one time. This landscape's anywhere from 30 to 40 million years old. So it's had all the weather that we've had over the years just drop rain through it, pass through it. So it's, it just turns, this, this rock turns into this really fine... A fine, very delicate material that washes away without the native forest. Fire brought in a lot, and with fire, you have a, a niche created for invasive plants, whether it's a locally invasive or something that's brought in from the outside. <laughs> Coming up. I see it's all up in the tree there. I look at vines in Saipan, and then on to Pompeii. And I think this is the fountain stone. The story continues at www.microneesiachallenge.org where you can learn more about the people you just met as well as the efforts of preserving the thousands of species of fish, plants, and wildlife in Micronesia. There are downloadable teaching modules for schools as well as an online video storytelling academy by Dan Ho. And of course, we look forward to your support of the Micronesia Challenge. Thank you.